just last week I met with a group of graduate students to talk with them about what they most wanted to learn Jewishly. And the number one thing they voted to learn about was different conceptions of God. And the second thing that they voted to learn about was why be Jewish and why be religious in the first place. And that's no different than the undergraduate students that I work with. I have coffee with a student. I try to have coffee with a student once a day. We call them coffee dates in Hillel. Talk to them about what's on their mind Jewishly. And for many of them, they need to figure out how to sort through their own beliefs about God, about authority uh, in the tradition, in order to find their place and decide how to be Jewish on their own. So I definitely find in my work that it's relevant I just want to um, take one step back and say to my teacher, Neil Gilman, that what I admire most about you as a teacher and as a theologian and what um, I think your greatest contribution has been to the field of Jewish theology is that you model and teach personal theology. And during my time at the seminary, we sat together for a semester and did an independent study on a theology of healing. It was uh, during a time when I was recovering from a very difficult hand injury. It had been so bad I couldn't take notes in class. I couldn't even carry the food in the cafeteria on my own cafeteria tray. And I was struck uh, going into the year that I studied with you about why it was that here I was, a rabbinical student, a religious person. I went to Minyan. I was on the Mishabeirach prayer. And yet God was so distant from me during that period of healing. It was almost tangential, these two things. And so we sat, and together you helped me discover new metaphors for God, a new personal theology that could speak to me at that particular moment in my life. And um, what I took uh, most from your book, Doing Theology, Jewish Theology, is that uh, you model that in how you write also. You open with a chapter on what you believe, um, but then you don't gloss over the fact that you've changed uh, what you think over the years. In fact, you say emphatically that teachers need to model that vulnerability of thinking one thing and then reconsidering, of putting themselves, their vulnerabilities, their achievements, their fail failures into the arena. And um, I think that's what gave me permission to define my personal theology at that particular moment in an ongoing way. And I think that's what gives students and young people and people of all generations uh, the courage to do that um, today. So in terms of college students and young people, I'm going to put myself in the young people category. Um, we've, got, we've got a range on campus. I've got the full range from unaffiliated, secular, orthodox, conservative, reform, just Jewish, popular way of talking about it. And the vast majority of them cannot accept a literal understanding of God. And for, for me and my own life, uh, I appreciate that I came, I feel like I was born believing in God. I came to believe in God maybe primarily because of my father's belief in God, but my father is also a Holocaust survivor. And I grew up with the story of his working on Shabbat for the first time by Nazi gunpoint, and realizing during that day that he wasn't struck down as he thought he would be, as he was taught in Cheder, um, for breaking Shabbat, and how that changed his literal understanding of, of what God is, but still believed that God exists, right? So I grew up with that, but it wasn't until I became more familiar with your work and with the way you talk about myth as a way of acknowledging that, that as liberals, we don't believe that God literally wrote the Torah, that it's a literal world of God, but yet it's, it's, not, it's not simply untrue, it's actually compelling and sacred and powerful because it is the organizing story of meaning by which we organize our lives. And that's what I wanted to convey to my students on Yom Kippur when I talked to them. Um, I wanted them to know that I, as a rabbi who um, tries to be traditional my practice uh, in different ways. Um, I don't believe God actually cares about whether or not we spend money on Shabbat or whether or not we eat McDonald's cheeseburgers. Rather, I think God cares about whether we live our lives with a sense of purpose and whether or not we have gratitude and seek forgiveness, whether we have a balance in our lives between work and rest, whether or not we are ethical and compassionate and concerned about justice. 
And I find when I talk to students that when they hear that larger message that God could care not about the details but about sort of the bigger picture, even if you want to talk about that metaphorically, it speaks to them and it starts to give them permission to figure out what they're going to do now that they're no longer living in their parents' house, uh, whether they're just undergraduates who are just newly out or the graduate students who for a very long period of time are not going to get married and have children and join synagogues. What choices are they going to make? And I find that this concept of, of myth allows them to sometimes choose on a case-by-case -case basis or on a spectrum what of the meaning speaks to them and to take it one step at a time, much as I did when I was taking on the observance of Shabbat when I was deciding if I was going to come to JTS and I found out that was a bit of a prerequisite for coming here. <laughs> I think that... Um, that, that um, college students are well aware of what Dr. Neil Gilman says, that ultimately in the modern age, the authority lies in ourselves. Um, Hillel has done research on a national level about what college students today think about a variety of things. And what they found is that Jews, young Jews today in their 20s and 30s, they're not motivated by guilt or by fear or any inherent sense of authority. What they're motivated by is meaning. And I know from talking to my mother that you know it's, it's people of all generations who feel that way, but I think that the pull of nostalgia or tradition that maybe an older generation feels because they were closer to it is not as strong for young people today. And I work with students who carry around iPods and order exactly the kind of coffee they want at Starbucks to the, to the very detail. They, they don't even have to buy an entire album of music. And so their context is completely a personalized one. And they're looking to find the meaning, in a sense, one song at a time to download on their iPod, to mix up in their own way. And that meaning has to be compelling, has to make the case for itself, but it also has to allow them to be distinctly Jewish, but also not insular. Because the same study from Hillel found that while they're searching for meaning, they don't want to only celebrate it with their Jewish friends. They want to celebrate it with their Jewish and their non-Jewish friends.